Um, I am very fortunate to have another Red Enlightenment episode where we're going inside the Renaissance Actor Studio. And uh, I was very fortunate to get Doug Kajolka. Hi. Uh, who has more experience possibly than any two local performers put together that I could imagine from being on the road. A long time. Yeah. Many years. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we're going to run through the, the questions and answers. And uh, hopefully, those of you viewing this, it will be a, a great, helpful bit of advice for you to go forward in your own character development and performance. I hope so. I, I think so. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, having spent workshops where Doug is coming to town a week early before to Arizona and come to workshops in person, uh, you download about a gallon of knowledge into a shot-sized performer's brain in that hour, hour and a half. Yeah, I try to do what I can. Yeah, yeah, it's helpful. Because you never know. You never know what pieces of information may make you go, oh, that's it. There, there was a lot. Uh, I'm pretty sure that it, we're just going to let this interview flow and <coughs> the nuggets of wisdom should fall accordingly. Hopefully they're not chicken nuggets. No, because there's no real chicken in those. I know. Really? Well, yeah. some. All right. Uh, Maybe there'll be some real wisdom. Possibly. Most likely. Uh, how did you get started as a performer uh, along the way? What jobs and characters did you have? And what was the genesis for the Don Juan and Miguel show? Wow. I got started as a performer. I think I wrote my first play when I was 10. And I literally had friends who lived across. I grew up in a really small lake community in northern Illinois out in the country. My dad had a gas station in the corner and we did, you know, the farmers all around. And I had friends who had a, a burnt out barn and we would we went upstairs and put aluminum foil on the walls and we started I wrote plays with these three kids uh, man thing son of man thing return of the son of man thing plant people you know these weird science fictiony plays that the I, man thing like Marvel <clears throat> comics man thing like like more like uh, mm. like a werewolf kind of thing but he oh, didn't right. know it you know so he was just man thing not like Mar I wasn't allowed to read comics as a kid oh. only when I was sick so and I was an avid reader and I wanted to be a writer. A lot so I, I started acting then, and I've acted in high school and in grade school. And um, I didn't want to get a degree in theater because I didn't know if I could trust myself. So I wanted to get a degree in anything else, pretty much. But I was a science geek, so I went into biology, pre, uh, pre med stuff for a while, and tried history, and ended up with psych and social. Uh, I started Renaissance fairs in, so I did that, and I got my equity card at 21, but I was already doing Renaissance fairs by the time I was 21. I had started in 1976, am I dating myself? Yes. Um, I was in college, and my good friend Bodge, who used to be queen at this festival, um, we went to high school together, and she, I was her good luck charm at auditions, she called me up and she said, hey Doug, uh, come to this audition, be my good luck piece, and went to the audition, it turned out to be closed, you had to be invited. Um, so they made me a stage manager so that I could sit in on the auditions. I had no idea what a rent fair was. And then the woman who was the director at the time I got it, I don't remember her name, it's before John Mills or between John Mills. Uh, she said, well, you have to audition. I'm like, I'm not here to audition. She goes, well, you have to. It's just the rule of everybody in the room. So I auditioned, they cast me in the lead of a Shakespeare play, a lead in the Commedia. They broke up these little groups to put me in and it caused all this mayhem, and I ended up being a singer with Bodge. We ended up doing madrigals for a couple of years. Uh, love it, love singing, love it, love it. Uh, great character work, and we approached our madrigals as characters. You know, we weren't the best singers in the world, but by God, we could have fun. Um, and then uh, we were doing, a, I was out of the show, and we, we uh, this is in uh, what is now Bristol, we used to be called King Richards, and we were doing a cutting of Taming of the Shrew? No, of uh, Romeo and Juliet. And Jose was Tybalt. And I was, in this cutting, I was every small character, like Poppy Carey, Benvolio, all these, I was every other little character. And we met there, and then they decided, he was already Don Juan, and they decided that he needed a, a manservant, a sidekick. And they assumed since I could sing, I could play guitar. So they hired me to walk around and play guitar, which I do not do, beyond Jose. And then when I met Jose, I thought they were going to teach me how to sword fight. I took a pay cut my first year with Jose. And they weren't. And then he taught me how to fight on the street. And they gave me my name and my helmet. That's what I got from them. Actually, the helmet cost me five bucks. The same helmet. Um, and this is 1980. You've gotten your money's worth on that helmet. Oh, yeah. Hell, yeah. 
and uh, 1980, and we just hit it off. The, the, our very first time working together, there was something, we weren't friends at all, really. We didn't know each other. He was part of the stage combatant jock people. I was part of the musician, you know, wasted people. We'd go behind the stages after the show and sing madrigals together and, you know, just do what musicians do. And he would do it what those, like, jouster guys did. And we hit it off and he was the one person who always said, I'm sorry it takes so long, but no. Uh, it takes time you need. He was the first person I'd worked with. Like, I, can't, I would write scripts. I would just come up with scripts. And he would say, yes, let us try that. And, you know, and like we did one script, I just remember it, it was so bad. Uh, sex change operations were all in the news at that time. And so we did a, a pirate who was once a woman on his ship, The Change, with his symbols, the meatball and the sword. <laughs> Very strange. And we performed in front of the audience, and when they went <laughs> like this, we never did that one again. But usually, we would try, you know, we pulled ideas from that and made another script. But he would just say, sure, let's try it. So that's what happened. And then, I think at one point, we were still going to, like, 10 years into our career, we'll have an over 30-year career now, we decided that we would focus on Renaissance Fairs. We did some stuff in Vegas. I didn't like being that vulgar that it required at the time, you know, to be in an adult show. I just didn't want to swear all the time. I don't certainly, obviously, people who know me, I don't mind innuendo at all. But I don't like it being served hot in a steamy, runny dish of gross. You make them work for it. Yeah, and, and, and that way kids can uh, talk to me. I don't have to be embarrassed about what I'm saying around children. Levels. 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 Yes. Yeah. Great. So. And then we said we're going to work together, and since then, we, you know. Done. So, how much research or preparation really went into Miguel? Um, a lot, actually. Yeah. Um, like they gave me my name, so I came up at the time. I, I, I worked on the the costume. It came the second year, and I've almost done the same costume almost every year since I've had it. I decided I would brand myself. Um, I came up with the two plume ideas. They were originally white, and then they went to red because. <laughs> the white one broke and the only red ones were available in the store and suddenly tick, 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 tick. Yeah, okay got it um i researched the name i also knew my look wasn't really all that hispanic or spanish um i took the i had to study the dialect you could talk a little bit like jose i had to listen to him a lot of the time and i made a tape recorder and i would make him say my name and, and talk so because it was easier for me to pick up his dialect it was for him to English, which he eventually got at one point, but it was horrible, so we made him go back because it wasn't as romantic. Um, and I researched, I took the name apart Miguel Rodriguez, Jesus Alfredo Esteban de Soto Gross. I could tell you what all those names mean, who they're part of. I decided at that time to take a half English background, uh, and we use a lot of the backstory still when we write stuff. Um, Miguel was a, a born in this little Catholic little boy in this little village, you know, this, outside the castle. This priest did favors for the you know, court that he picked up Miguel saying, here, be the manservant to this guy. And I researched manservants and they're whipping boys and they're all those things, but they're not gotten rid of. So we decided we'd have a lifelong relationship that way. And it also allowed me to be intelligent because part of the thing, like as a lower class character, why would I read, why would I write, why would I know all these languages, why would I know all this historical stuff? So we decided to educate me. and. You know, and it's really, and so it, we, we created, I read Spanish history. Um, I it took a lot of time pre-internet to go into libraries, which are still great things, uh, read books. Uh, and I researched the Spanish history from the Spanish point of view, which is a completely different world than what the English Renaissance world is about. And, yeah. and then even researching England, it's like, there's no Renaissance. There isn't. It's Elizabethan, and they had a little perk, but it really was Elizabethan times. The Renaissance was almost done you know, by right. the time it hit. So I did a lot of research and, and decided to um, really love being Spanish and really love being Catholic because all Spaniards are Catholic. So, you know, research the old church and actually use that religion as a way to open doors instead of closing them. Well, you know, I'm not one of these people. I'm right. a, kind of an American Catholic. You know, <laughs> I. I go to confession, I'm done, I can just end for the rest of the week. It's a very Spanish point of view too. Yeah. The whole siesta thing is about having secret lovers and all this stuff and, you know, people, they, they realize there are people, so, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, even researching the Armada, 
finding out that the man who had led it had never been to sea. The man who had led the Armada, this huge thing, had, his uncle was a fabulous sea captain. So uh, the uh, cleft palated, toy collecting, little dog collecting king of Spain said, no, you must do this or I will take away your lands. So he led the thing and a bunch of the ships were filled with, like out of that Gilbert and Sullivan uh, thing, with cousins and aunts and sisters and relatives and food and because they thought they were going to come in, boat in, scare England. They would say, oh no, we really should be together because we were at one time and all hell broke those big storms. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thank God. It's not over yet though. No, it's always, yeah, always coming. Uh, are there any daily rituals you have that help you get into the right mindset or get into character? Yes, actually I think it's very important. I think it is a, 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 a very important aspect. I, I teach at Sterling, so I, yeah. I, and I share this with actors there as well. Um, yes, and it depends on the fair. I prefer I have my different ri ritual, but I like to get up. I like to immediately warm up, start warming up vocally when I get right away when I get up. Make my coffee. Before I'm having coffee in my mouth, I'm trilling. I'm trilling. I'm starting to work on the voice. I'm no spring chicken anymore. Outdoor theater is not easy. On my stretch, uh, I, <laughs> I put on my costume, I stare in the mirror, I put on my face, do you know, I put on the helmet, I put on my walk. I mean, I haven't researched my walk. I had to change my walk once. I used to walk really pigeon-toed mm -hmm. all in, and it literally ruined my lower back. It popped out discs over years, and I had to take physical therapy and change. And so now I walk more like, still, I still have a moving body center so that it, I don't have to think about Miguel, it's all, it's, I, I, I put on the body center, so I don't have to think about what I look like. And even Jeff Cobb, the source writer, laughs, he goes, wow, that was two footsteps in the character. I'm like, I'm just getting my body. I'm not thinking, oh, now I'm Miguel, and I have to love Don Juan, and you know, do all this stuff. I'm just like, this is physically what Miguel looks like. And now I can just talk like Miguel, and it frees up my brain, so I have more hard drive <laughs> wow. left. Yeah, so I'm a really, it's very technical. And so I do that. So I get up every morning. I, I, I have a song I always sing, you know, from years ago. And uh, as Uta Hagen says, you should have a secret. I have a little secret, you know. But, like, one of the fun things, I think if you're at home working on your character, and characters only really come alive as defined by other characters. Do you know what I mean? It's the tree falling in the forest. The relationships. Yeah, the tree falling in the forest, the sound, no. Because sound is defined by being heard technical definition of sound. It's not just waves through the air. It's, it's actually being heard by an ear. So a character does that, but it's a lot, it's fun sometimes to sit and, and play with your character alone. Like, what would Miguel do when he's alone? What's his rituals before he goes to sleep? What prayers does he say? What doesn't he do? So I actually have all those things. I've thought about it. I don't use them all the time, but, but my morning ritual is um, the same. When it, um, I think last year Jose got hurt because our morning ritual was obscured by the fire. Yeah. His, that was his crazy warm -ups day. Are, yeah, his warm-ups are later. Mine are right away, and I warm up before I go to sleep on Friday nights. So you were already warmed up and into Miguel when the fire started? Yeah, I was already done. And But Miguel is not a character that takes over. I can shut him on and off. Oh, that's that's good. I just was picturing Miguel putting out the fire in my brain. And yeah, going, wait, <laughs> no, look, we have to pee on it or something, you know, so. Yeah, that was a good <laughs> mental image. Yeah, uh, yeah. But no, but I can literally, it, it. I don't like to turn it on and off. I don't think it's a good thing to do, but after so many years, I think sometimes if a sword breaks or somebody gets hurt, you have to go. I work with some people who can't turn off their characters, and it's like, method is such a lovely way to get to a character. Technique allows you to maintain it without exhaustion. Those are the people who are exhausted, are the people who are breathing the character. And there's nothing wrong with that, it's just harder work. Yeah. Yeah, there's a point where you have to get back to you. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. it is you. Your character is you. You don't. You can't create from a vacuum. I can't speak a word unless I know it. You know what I mean? So my character can't do anything unless it's within the range of what I, as a human being, can conceive of doing. Miguel doesn't know anything in some level that Doug, Doug, Doug doesn't. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, there are extensions of ourselves. They're like... Um, uh, my friend Bodge, once again, she called them sacred puppets. We put on these puppets, and they're sacred, and they're beautiful, and they have an intent. I have an intent. I have an artistic statement I am making as Miguel all the time. It's mine. Very, very simplest thing in the world. But without it, I would not be out on the street. 
I would not be motivated to to do what I'm doing. So I put on the, the sacred idea and the sacred puppet, and I'm like, this is what I love doing. Now, that can be exhausting, too. And sometimes the best days, the most fun days, are the most draining. I've wept after shows. I mean, I've gone back to my... And, and sometimes I wept not because I, I'm hurt, but Dana uh, and Shannon and Baj and I would talk about this. We would weep because in some ways when you're in front of a big crowd of people and they adore you, you're never going to get that in your personal life, regardless of how much that significant other loves you. They can only love you so much. And sometimes I think that's why a lot of performers become addicts of this or that. Because they can't get that moment on stage. I'm addicted to it. I love it. Love it. It's great validation. Yeah. Yeah, it is great validation. And, you know, if people like it, then it's even better. And if they start to, like I've watched kids grow up. And these kids are growing up nice in a way that I was hoping that I would affect them. Do you know, like, too, Miguel's pretty outrageous, you know. I, he's a sexually questionable, you know. Half the people consider him just a, a flaming character. Half the people are like, he has no genitals at all, whatever, you know. And I am doing that on purpose. It's like, accept people for who they are, for what they have. Say, you know, in the yes and world. And also, play is a good thing. War is bad. Pain is bad. Friends are good. Life is good. Don't judge people because they're different or handicapped or black or Hispanic or whatever. You know, I mess with handicapped people and mess with everybody. And by messing, I mean play. Some people say messing being cruel or mean. I'm not mean. I'm not. I'm like being mean. No. No. It hurts me when I have to. Sometimes you have to. You have to shut somebody up. I have to. So. Um. Name dropping time. Uh, who are some of the performers who influenced you the most? Danny Kay is a performer that influenced me greatly. Um, Carol Burnett and the whole uh, the whole crew that show influenced me Corman, greatly. Leachman. All of them. Yeah, I mean, amazing. Harvey hey, Corman. Uh, uh, what's his? Uh, Tim Conway. Tim Conway, who's yeah. the most strangest. He's the most like our Danny Lord, you know, in, in the world of Renaissance affairs. Dan, Google him, he's an incredibly funny man. Um, those people, Red Skelton a little bit, uh, but he was a little crazy for me, but I love the different characters he did. Ruck Hudson influenced me a lot uh, because he just twinkled so much. Cary Grant because he was, had complete aplomb. And in reality, Arsene Dupin who used to work out at this festival, who is a, is a performer who influenced me a lot as a young Miguel. Because I came from, it's interesting, when we started, you know, Jose did all the, he could sword fight and he could juggle, and he has a black belt and this and that, and he has all these physical skills, and he's a state champion of Wisconsin for fencing, and not stolen goods, swords. And uh, I was a singer. My skill is singing, I mean, which is, or, or com comedy too, I guess. <clears throat> And a lot of people, when they, when they, Jose started working, they're like, this isn't going to work. Because Doug's an actor, a singer. He's not a variety performer, like we are. And our sense like, no, this is going to work beautifully. His variety skills will become his acting, will be his skill. You know, uh, but our sand did, Danny Lord influenced me a lot. But uh, Kemper Net Show, really. And then uh, voice coaches and singers, some cartoons. Cartoon thing. I w all right. I was watching a Looney Tunes cartoon. Um, it, they actually I put one on TV on Cartoon Network, and there was a Bugs Bunny cartoon where he's in drag. He's getting hit on by Elmer Fudd, and he actually went stop it. <laughs> and I went, oh my God, that sounded just like well, yeah. you mm -hmm. know what you do as a kid really influences you. And yeah. You pull it out. And it's interesting that voice when when I started him, I, I purposely went into. This kind of voice, because it allows me uh, a range of being funny. Wait! You know, I, I just the comic is in the... Comedy to me has rhythm and music and pitch and variance. So getting older, the voice is harder to maintain. And I, I'm an asthmatic, I took a hand for a while, which I will never take again. Um, and at the end of three months of it, I was doing... Wait! I mean, it lowered my voice so much, because whatever it does, 